I've, I've just spoken on this issue a lot of places where I go give three or four talks on the warning passages. So obviously I have to be brief, but the heart and soul of, of what uh, I'm saying is I believe that warning, I believe all the warning passages, maybe I should back up. Yeah, as I think about this, how should I approach this? I believe Hebrews is a sermon. You receive this message of exhortation, parakasaos. Uh, it's a sermon. Uh, Acts 13, 15, when this is the same Greek word, when they asked Paul, do you have any word of encouragement? It's translated differently here, but same idea, right? And Paul gives a sermon. So I think Hebrews is a sermon. How do we think, conceive of the book of Hebrews? Hebrews isn't a book fundamentally, look at all this amazing theology <laughs> I'm giving you. Hebrews is fundamentally a sermon in which he exhorts the readers not to fall away. So what's, what's the main point of the letter to the Hebrews? It's, I, it's don't fall away. You can say it in three words. The theology of the book, that great Christology, Jesus is a Melchizedekian priest. All the theology of the book, the fulfillment that's come in, the, in, in Christ, all the theology serves the exhortation. Right? The, the theology is the foundation for the exhortation because biblical writers never just give imperatives without indicatives because imperatives without indicatives are just legalism, right? They never do that. They always give you the imperative. The imperative undergirds the indicative. So um, the imperative is don't fall away. Now, the question is, who's he talking to? My argument as well is all the, all, the, all the warning passages. So where are the warning passages? We could say chapters 2, 1 through 4, 3, 3 12 through... Um, no, 3 7 really through 4 13. 5 11 through 6 12, 6 8. You know, where they end is sometimes hard to determine. Chapter 10 is especially hard, but if you focus 10 26 through 31, chapter 12, verses 25 through 29. So, a very interesting book, isn't it? Theology punctuated with five warning passages. I argued that all these warning passages ought to be interpreted synoptically, see them together. Or, or another way to put it is they mutually interpret one another. Or another way to put it is they're all saying the same thing. <laughs> it's a sermon. He wants these people not to fall away. He gives them exhortations not to fall away. So it's kind of, or it's kind of like a kaleidoscope, right? You know, I don't know what a kaleidoscope is. You shake it, and you get a different picture. But it's the same kaleidoscope. So you, you, he shakes it five times. And, and it's like any good preacher. He has a main point he wants to make, and he returns to it again and again, and he says it a little different way every time. But it's all one main point. What do I like about this for pastors and for teachers? What I like about it is, first, the book is a pastoral book. It isn't just... What's Hebrews? Just some abstract theological treatise that we have a hard time relating to because none of us want to offer animal sacrifices anyway. <laughs> no, that's not what the book is fundamentally about. And, and the other thing I like about it is some people think, oh, Hebrews is so hard. But I, but I want to argue, yes, it can be difficult. It's not so hard. The main point of the book is easy to see. So So... When we read it, we have, we have, uh, we ha we know the lay of the land. We know where we're going, you know? So we, we see what he's doing, and we interpret everything in light of the whole. So I'm, I'm always about a simplicity on the other side of complexity, right? To be simplistic, that's bad, isn't it? But there's a simplicity on the other side of complexity. That's good. And as pastors and teachers, we really want, we want to be simple. You know, I, I preach to a lot of seminary students from the beginning, but I, I said to myself, I'm going to preach 
in this church the way I would preach no matter who's here. I'm not going to preach to seminary students. I'm going to think of how I'd preach with children as well. And actually, over the years, I, I regularly in my sermons address the children. Uh, not every sermon, but I'll stop and address them just to say, hey, you're part of this congregation. So anyway, simplicity on the other side of complexity. So the question is, if all the warning passages synoptically are to be synoptically interpreted, they mutually interpret one another, what do we do with this warning passage, which is the most famous, right? What do we do with Hebrews 6? I would argue that the descriptions there are descriptions of believers. They were once enlightened. That most naturally refers to conversion. And in fact, the author uses that expression one other time. Remember the earlier days when after you had been enlightened, you endured a hard struggle with sufferings. Sometimes you were publicly exposed to taunts and afflictions. That enlightenment there is most naturally understood to refer to their conversion. They tasted the heavenly gift. I think that's probably salvation. You know, you could say it'd be the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit's mentioned in the next line. So probably the heavenly gift is salvation. They shared in the Holy Spirit. They tasted God's good word, the gospel, right? And the powers of the coming age. The promises, right? Everything we've been talking about in this class. They've entered the new age. Now, the other interpretation says, oh, they just tasted it. They just sipped it, right? It's just a sipping. Now, that's not fully saving, but what does he mean by the metaphor taste? And I think the author himself tells us. Is it 2.8 or 2.9? Yeah, 2 9. Jesus tasted death for everyone. Did he just sip it? Don't we'll sip it down. No, no, no. I guess I don't want that. So that one, that's not what happened, right? He fully ingested it. So if we look at the way the author, the only other time he uses the word taste, he doesn't use it of sipping. He means fully experience. So, you know, that reading, the tasting, the sipping makes sense. But is it really in accord with what the author is doing? I think not. Also, sharing in the Holy Spirit. The other side says, well, you know, this is not a saving sharing. But the, the word sharing in Hebrews is used of partaking of milk. It's actually a bad thing in context. But the partaking of milk mean, doesn't mean you, you're not really having it, <laughs> right? You're, you're, you're drinking milk. It's used of Jesus sharing flesh and blood. That doesn't mean Jesus wasn't really flesh and blood. He fully shared in flesh and blood. And we have other examples of this. It's always used of a real and full sharing. There's no indication that it's just a little sharing. So I, I don't agree with the traditional Reformed reading. And the traditional Reformed reading is these are almost Christians, but not quite. I believe that this passage describes Christians, and therefore the warning is given to believers. Charles Spurgeon is an advocate of my view. Charles Spurgeon, I'm, I'm paraphrasing the quote, Spurgeon says, you know, if you read Dr. Gill, Dr. Owen, and all the great reformers, they say these people are not quite Christians. And he says, I love and respect them all, but when it comes to this passage, their judgments are a little bit warped. <laughs> because he said, even a child, maybe, maybe he overemphasizes it, but I love it. He says, even a child recognizing this passage would recognize they're Christians. Because it says they have the Spirit. And the Spirit is the mark of having a believer. Wayne Grudem, my, by the way, Wayne Grudem is a very dear friend of mine. I, I know Wayne well personally. I love Wayne to death. So um, he, is, he is a dear a dear colleague and friend. And Wayne's written an article 
in the book Bruce Ware and I edited, Still Sovereign, and I asked him to write this article, and I knew I disagreed with him when I asked him to write it. Why would you do that? Because I was already writing two articles in the book, and I couldn't write a third one. And, um, and, and, and Wayne holds the traditional reform view, and I knew he'd do a great job explaining it, and I think he did do a great job, and I salute the work Wayne did. I think it's fantastic, and I think it's wrong, you know? So there it is. We disagree on that, and uh, we'll find out when we go to heaven who's right, right? But, but Wayne argues, look, look, they're not really Christians because it doesn't say they're forgiven of their sins. It doesn't say they were sanctified, and he goes through this list of 18 things it should have said if they were really believers. But my reply to that is, Wayne, you're cheating. That's cheating. You can't set criteria in advance about what an author has to say. You have to deal with what he does say. And, and, and to say that they have the Holy Spirit, what else do you want? <laughs> you, can't, you can't demand in advance, so it has to say you're forgiven of your sins. And furthermore, I actually think that he says, and it doesn't say they're sanctified, but I would say it does say they're sanctified in the other warning passage. They profane the blood of the covenant by which you was sanctified. It does say they were sanctified. But when Wayne comes to that passage, he goes, well, that's not real sanctification. That's like the sanctification that comes through the blood of animals, which doesn't really cleanse. Interesting argument. Fascinating argument. I mean, Wayne's brilliant, right? That's a very creative, interesting argument. But my argument is he's talking about the blood of Christ. He's not talking about the blood of animals. You're actually reversing everything the book is doing. The book is saying the blood of Christ is so different than the blood of animals, and now you're comparing the blood of Christ that was shed for these people to the blood of animals? No, he's talking about real sanctification here. It doesn't work. Nice try. Doesn't work. Yeah, question. Um, you, you, you just sipped it. You sipped it. So those are, that's what the tasting. You just sipped it. You didn't swallow it down. Oh, uh, you didn't quite get it. You know, you sip, you didn't, you, you didn't swallow it down. You just tasted it. Tasted it and spit it out. That's how they do it, yeah. yeah. So, y you make up your mind on this. You know, it's obviously, it's a very disputed passage. But then, you know, then the argument that I get is, you must be an Arminian. And you must believe you can lose your salvation because, well, I'm going too fast. Except for except for if you're a, um, um, what, what's the movement called? It just slipped my mind. Unless you're the, the Zane Hodges group. You know that group? The non-lordship salvation group. They say, oh, these, these passages are addressed to Christians and they're just talking about rewards. But they're the only interpreters in the history of the church who've thought that. And it's clearly wrong. I'm not going to spend time on that. They're, they're the can't lose exegesis people. I mean, he talks about trampling the sun underfoot and facing God's vengeance, and they say you're just losing your reward. I think it's, that is such an improbable view. So hardly anybody holds that view, except for them. Actually, you know, they're around, right? That group is around, uh, but I think he's clearly talking about salvation and final judgment. So the Arminians say, look, it's written to Christians. If you fall away, you'll be damned. That's the end of the passage. The argument Canada and I make, Spurgeon made, we're not the only ones, others in the history of the church, is these warning passages are always effective in the lives of the elect. Those who are elect always heed the warnings so that the warnings are always effective in those who are truly saved. Were there some in the Hebrews community that weren't truly saved? Probably, but he specifically addresses believers. The warnings are a means by which those who are saved are preserved. Some people say, why do you need them? If you're going to be preserved, you don't need the warnings. My argument in response to that is, the Bible says we need the means. The Bible says we need them. So I'll give you an example or two. I'll give you two. And then I think I'm going to go right to Revelation because time is passing, okay, after we do this. I wanted to do more, but see, I just start talking and talking, talking. So 
A good example, an illustration of promise and warning work is the shipwreck. Acts 27. You know, they're having the shipwreck. They sail at a bad time. Paul stands up. I love this story. You know, Paul's a prisoner on the ship, but he's like the, he's like the captain, isn't he? Paul's such a leader. Has there ever been a prisoner who acted like this on a ship? Anyway, you know, it's the middle of the storm. Everything falls apart, right? They've been without food for a long time. Paul stands up and says, you men should have followed my advice. That's my life verse right there, you know? <laughs> Just post that on your wall as pastor, right? There it is. You have it. Maybe I'm taking it out of context. So (laughs) anyway, Paul just had to say, by the way, I was right. We made a mistake here. But let's go on. Now, I urge you to take courage because there will be no loss of any of your lives, but only of the ship. Promise. No loss of life. Right? How do you see know that? Last night, an angel of the God I belong to and serve stood by me. Hey, that's a pretty good reason not to know it, right? I mean, to know it. An angel told him. Isn't that a great description of a Christian? What does he say? He, doesn't he witness to them even in saying this? I belong to this God. I serve this God. And the angel said, don't be afraid, Paul. It is necessary for you to appear before Caesar, that is, get to Rome. And indeed, God has graciously given you all those who are sailing with you. What did the angel promise you? Every single person on the ship is going to live. And that's how the story ends, all 276. And Luke is careful to say, all 276 live. Promise. What would you have done if you had gotten a promise like that? I'll tell you what I would have done. I would have gone down in the hold of the ship. I would have had my lunch, as Paul did. I would have gotten Netflix out turned it on and said, let's just watch some movies or a series before this ends, you know? A good time to binge watch, you know? And, and then we'll just see how this all turns out. But that's not what Paul did. So, verse 27. When the 14th night came, we were drifting in the Adriatic Sea, and about midnight the sailors thought they were approaching land. They took soundings and found it to be 120 feet deep. When they'd sailed a little farther and sounded again, they found it to be 90 feet deep. Obviously, it's getting shallower, getting close to land. Then fearing we might run aground on the rocks, they dropped four anchors from the stern and prayed for daylight to come. Some sailors tried to escape from the ship. They let down the skiff, the little boat, right, into the sea, pretending that they were going to put out anchors from the bow. So some of the sailors were going to escape Paul says, unless these men stay in the ship, you cannot be saved. Warning. If you let these people go, you're going to (laughs) die. Why why has he got a promise? Why why is the warning? Paul apparently believed warnings fit with promises, right? The, The warning is the means by which the promise is secured. That's how it works. And it always works in the lives of the elect. Another example. Mark 13. We won't worry about how you interpret these verses eschatologically. We could be there all day, right? But verse 21, or speaking of the tribulation, it's going to be terrible, right? Verse 20. If the Lord had not cut those days short, no one would be saved. Whether that's physical or spiritual is debated, but but he cut the days short for the sake of the elect whom he chose, Then if anyone tells you, see, here is the Messiah, see there, do not believe it. For false messiahs and false prophets will arise and will perform signs and wonders to lead astray, if possible, the elect. To believe, I would say this, if you believe in a false messiah, you're not a Christian. If you say, Joe, over here is the Messiah, when Jesus is the Messiah, you don't believe in the true Messiah, you're not saved. (laughs) You're not saved if you believe in a false messiah. And he says, The signs and wonders are so great. Whatever event you refer this to, we're not worried about that here, that even believers would be prone to believe in these false messiahs. He said they could lead astray, if possible, the elect. But it's not possible, right? The elect can't be deceived. You won't be. You can't be. Why not? You're elect. But what's the next thing he says? And you must watch. I've told you everything in advance. Be alert. 
And that's how the, you know, it's all the same context. What does he say? Watch, be alert. And what I say, I say to you, everyone, be alert. Watch out. Be ready. What does he mean? Be spiritually ready. Don't believe in a false Messiah. I've told you all this. The warning, the promise. You won't be deceived. Watch out that you're not. <laughs> right? The two come together. So the, the warnings are the means by which the promises are secured. That way, we can take the warnings seriously when we preach and teach them. We can say to people what the Bible says. If you deny Jesus, he'll deny you. If you fully and finally deny Jesus, Peter denied Jesus, right? But he repented. But if you fully and finally deny Jesus, he'll deny you. You'll go to hell. Those who are truly saved, they won't do it, right? They'll finally repent. Okay, do you want to say anything about this? Questions, comments? Okay, so we end with something simple, the book of Revelation. Yeah, yeah. No, no, it's good. If you were to do a, which you would want to, but babe, just a, you know, a short time in, in Hebrews, would you, would you make your five points the warnings? Like if you were to do a five-week series on Hebrews or something? No, I would do, no, because I'd, want, because I'd be afraid that they'd just understand the warnings without understanding the background. So I think I, if I were doing a five-week series in Hebrews, I'd just give them a big sweep. Of the, I'd probably do, I would do all five warning passages, but I'd also include the theology in each one as kind of the background for the warning, I think. Yeah. yeah but Hebrews would be tough to do in five. Could be done, though. There is a place. You know, Mark Dever preaches these one-off sermons on each book, which is... I, I only did that with the Pentateuch. And with Genesis, I did two. I just couldn't do one. But I did it Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. That's the only time I did it. It almost killed me, and I never did it again. But it's, but it's probably a good thing to do. I probably should have done it more. I just couldn't. I never did it with the New Testament book. So, okay, Revelation. So, you know, there are many different views of Revelation in evangelicalism, of course. Um, And uh, that keeps us, you know, gives us something to argue about, stuff like that, right? <laughs> so, of course, Revelation says Jesus is coming soon. Liberals read that and say, look, it didn't, it didn't happen. Revelation is wrong. You know, that, uh, what's the liberal appropriation of Revelation? Jesus got it wrong. John got it wrong. Jesus didn't come back. Um, I think when you actually read the whole of the New Testament, the matter is quite complex. There are passages that say he's coming soon, and there's passages that say there'll be delay. So how do you interpret those passages? <clears throat> They're not easy to interpret. I understand the New Testament this way. Every generation, see what you think of this, every generation has rightly said, Jesus may come in our generation. Every generation has said that. And it's never been locked down. That is, he may not come. So it keeps us on our toes. The way eschatology is written, it's not, it can't be calculated. So we always are to be ready. And then we think of the contribution of 2 Peter. One day with the Lord is as a thousand years. So another thing I like to say is, it's been two days. That's not so long, right? Maybe you could wait three or four. Who knows? Well, so many things we could say. A fascinating verse on the Trinity. Maybe I should point this out because it's so important. John, to the seven churches in Asia, grace and peace to you from the one who is, who was, and who is to come. That's clearly the Father in context, right? He is. He says to a church that's suffering. He is. He is. He, I am who I am. He is. He was. He reigns forever, and he's coming. And, you know, you might think, well, the one coming is Jesus, but no, because Jesus is not mentioned here, and from Jesus Christ. So, that can't be, that can't be Jesus, that's the Father, isn't it? From Jesus Christ, the faithful witness. Ah, that's what they're called to be, right? Jesus is also your example. The firstborn from the dead, are you going to die for your faith? Maybe, but Jesus was risen from the dead. 
And do you think the do you think the kings of the earth? Do you think Rome in their day is ruling the world? Now Jesus rules the kings of the earth. He's in control. And remember the cross to him who loves us and has been set, and set us free from our sins by his blood. You know, Revelation is full of a lot of weird teachings that you wouldn't read anywhere else, like the cross of Jesus, how fundamental it is to our faith. What a bizarre book. It's about the cross of Jesus. Oh, such strange, unusual teaching. So, so, grace and peace from the Father, from Jesus Christ, and from the seven spirits before the throne. Who are the seven spirits? Well, there's obviously seven of them, right? Is it an angel, as David Ani says? But no, it can't be an angel. Why not? Because grace and peace is only from God. Never, ever do we read in the New Testament, grace and peace to you from God the Father and the Archangel Michael. <laughs> Never, right? It's always grace and peace to you from God the Father and from Jesus Christ. Never do we read grace and peace to you from God the Father, Jesus Christ, and the Apostle Paul. <laughs> no, grace and peace comes from God. So, it's apocalyptic literature, right? Grace and peace to you from God the Father and from the seven spirits. There's not seven Holy Spirits, but the number is used symbolically, obviously, right? It signifies the perfection of the Spirit. Grace and peace to you from the Father, from the Spirit, and from the Son. What a beautiful Trinitarian reference. At the beginning of the book, the seven spirits, there's not seven Holy Spirits. It signifies the perfection of who the Spirit is. How wonderful and beautiful that is. Yes, Revelation is full of very many strange things like God is sovereign, <laughs> right? He's sovereign. He's the, he's the Alpha and the Omega. God's throne. Look at, I just put the references there for you. God reigns. He rules. Who's it written to? A church that's suffering. What does he say to a suffering church? God reigns. God rules. Do you feel like he's reigning right now? When you're being put to death, he's reigning. He's ruling. You know, the church throughout the ages has it suffered, especially suffering churches. They've loved the book of Revelation, rightly so. After the address to the seven churches, what's the first thing we read? We, he takes us into the throne room of God, doesn't he? No surprise. Where does he take us? Into God's throne room. What's going on in that throne room? Very symbolic language, isn't it? Very strange stuff going on here. He was in the spirit. There's a throne. The one seated on the throne had the appearance of jasper and carnelian stone. A rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald surrounded the throne. What Old Testament passage is like this? Anybody think of it? Ezekiel 1, 26 through 28. So anybody who's read the Old Testament thinks, oh, that's Ezekiel, right? After that strange vision of those four living creatures in Ezekiel, you have this reference. So one of the key, herm you already know this, but one of the key hermeneutical principles is Revelation ought not to be interpreted by newspaper eschatology, right? So many people have used newspaper eschatology. How many people as the, the days shift? You know, the Antichrist is JFK. I've heard that, right? Shot in the head after all. RFK, Henry Kissinger, Saddam Hussein. There have been many guesses. There are books out of all the guesses throughout history. So far, the batting average is zero, you know. I've always thought the Antichrist was Reagan because I think he's still coming back. Because Ronald Wilson Reagan, 666. There it is. Oh, well, well, maybe not, maybe not. He's been gone a long time now, so. But here's my point. The hermeneutical key is the Old Testament, isn't it? Not the newspaper. You all, you all know that. You're all sophisticated seminary students, but the people in our churches don't know that often. They're taught other things. So around that throne are 24 thrones. There's 24 elders dressed in white clothes. I believe, you know, if you look at the Old Testament again, the four living creatures are the cherubim, seraphim of Ezekiel. So these are, and I think that's true of the 24 elders as well. They're angelic creatures. What's going on in the throne room? It's a thunderstorm. 
You know, you don't get many thunderstorms. We were just talking about this at the break. You don't get many thunderstorms in Southern California. I come from Oregon, not many thunderstorms there. But I've been in some doozies in Minnesota and Louisville, you know? And uh, I was just telling Zach on the break that uh, there was one where my, my two of my kids, they were teenagers, where we weren't home. They were grilling outside and lightning hit a house and burned it down five, five houses away from where we live. Boom, you know? The problem is when you have a lot of thunderstorms, kids think, like, that's fine. We can go outside. <laughs> we can go out and grill. It's okay. Um, but um, fortunately, the Lord spared them. But in this, in this, in this room, there's lightning and thunder thunder and, and uh, there's a sea of glass and it's the picture, right? It's, it's awesome in that room. It's awesome in that room. Entering God's presence is awesome. And how does he describe them? Well, how do you describe the indescribable? He picks beautiful stones, right? You can't describe God. He's beautiful. He's awesomely beautiful. So that's a key to the book, isn't it? And so we're not surprised. What are they doing in that room? They're saying, like Isaiah 6, right? Holy, holy, holy. You're, you're, you're the holy God. You're he, who, who was and who is and who is to come. Again, the Father is the one to come here. Jesus is coming, but it can be said of the Father as well. And they're worshiping him as the creator, right? That's where the passage ends. They worship God as the creator. Chapter 5. He's still there on the throne. There's this book with seven seals. Who is worthy? Big key word, right? Who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? That's the key question. Answer, no one. No one in heaven and earth or under the earth. So he really emphasizes that no one was worthy. No one was found worthy to open the scroll. Yeah, I'll take a question in a minute or look into it. Then one of the elders said to me, don't weep. Look. The prophecies are fulfilled. He's the lion of the tribe of Judah. He's the root of David. The Davidic covenant has become a reality. The promises, the promises God has given, Revelation is saying they've been fulfilled. He's able to open the scroll and its seven seals. So a key in Revelation, the elders said, don't weep. But when he looked, right? He doesn't see a lion, but he sees a lamb. He doesn't see a lion. He's told he's a lion, but he sees a lamb. Is it a lion or a lamb? It's both, right? It's both. It's apocalyptic, you know? It's both. Because he wins his victory by being a lamb, a slaughtered lamb. He doesn't conquer his enemies by just ravaging them the way a lion would. He wins the victory through the cross. That's what Revelation is saying. Oh, how strange Revelation is. Jesus wins the victory through the cross, you know? That's what we find out in the rest of the Bible. It's not so different. They sang a new song. What are they singing? You're worthy. You are worthy because you were slaughtered. So there's the cross, and you purchase people for God by your blood from every tribe and language and people and nation. I believe, we're not here to talk about this, but I believe that verse supports definite atonement. You purchased some from every tribe, tongue, people, and nation. And you made them a kingdom, and they'll rule. And then they worship, they worship the Lamb. So, you know, that, those are just very programmatic passages for Revelation. Uh, I, I kind of went ahead there just because we were in that text because I'm really on God's sovereignty. The kingdom was given to the beast, and here I just note the word adathe, and, and maybe we should just look at one of them. I just want you to see it in Greek as well. You may be very familiar with this, but in Revelation, again and again, we're told that it was given to the beast. And I argue along with many interpreters that that's God. That's God. The beast's authority, the beast's authority to, to rule and reign, that kind of, God gives it to him at the end of the day. God's sovereign. So the, 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 the beast's authority is not, is not an authority finally has. Now, Satan gives the beast the authority, doesn't he? But over that is God, kind of like the book of Job. Satan gives the beast the authority, but God's, God's sovereign. So he's saying no king is... No ruler is finally doing to you what I haven't allowed them to do. 